Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, plenty of political drama in Washington today, and this time it's Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein at the centre of the chaos. Reports that he was summoned to the White House today to either resign or be fired sent the Capitol into a frenzy, mainly because he's the man in charge of the Mueller investigation into the Trump campaign's dealings with Russia. Let's go live now to our Washington correspondent, Kylie Morris. So, Kylie, after all of these rumours swirling, what actually happened today? Well, Cathy, they're calling it a hurricane that went away in a hurry here. But in the past few hours, there were strong suspicions and reporting that Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General, who, as you say, has oversight over the Mueller inquiry into possible Russia collusion, was about to resign. Now, he's been a focus over the past few days after the New York Times published a report that he denies that he'd talked about wearing a wire in the White House and invoking the 25th Amendment to remove the president. So cue an early morning car ride to the White House for Rod Rosenstein and an expectation, I think, by that stage that this might evolve into a sacking or a resignation, but no constitutional crisis yet. John Kelly, Keith's chief of staff, came out and shook his hand for the cameras. He's still in his job. On what terms, we don't know, but no doubt we will find out. The White House is now saying the president and Rod Rosenstein will meet on Thursday, a potentially useful distraction from the much-anticipated hearing for Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh and the woman who's accused him of sexual assault, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford. But for now, at least, Rod Rosenstein remains at the helm of the Mueller inquiry, and the president is safe from any further accusations, as though he needs any more, of meddling in the special counsel's investigation into Russia. Now, a person of real interest to that inquiry into possible links between the Trump campaign and Russia, someone who's faced questioning from no fewer than three congressional committees, a grand jury and Mueller investigators, is the British music publicist Rob Goldstone. Now, Rob Goldstone, who maybe wrote the most scrutinised email in modern American history, is about to bring out a book and has spoken to us. But first, a reminder of his role in the drama that continues to swirl around this White House. No oxygen, I couldn't die. Okay. By Rob Goldstone's account, he's just a guy caught up in the tempest over alleged Russian collusion circling the Trump White House. He's the publicist who says he was doing his client a favor when he organized a meeting at Trump Tower in New York City with the Trump campaign team for a Russian lawyer with links to the Kremlin. You may remember him from his quirky Facebook videos, which received unexpected scrutiny after the story broke in July last year. Now the publicist has turned his sudden notoriety into a book opportunity. Forget Bob Woodward's fear. Here's pop stars, pageants and presidents. The pop star is Emin Agalarov, Azerbaijan's biggest name and the heir to a real estate fortune in Moscow. The pageant, the now infamous Moscow Miss Universe of 2013, where the president-to-be, Donald Trump, was owner of the pageant. We're very happy the Miss Universe pageant is just setting records. His alleged nighttime activities in a Moscow hotel, satirized by Mr. Agalarov in his latest video. But it was the email Rob Goldstone wrote to Don Trump Jr. just months before the election that placed him at ground zero of the Russia investigation. In it, he writes, the Crown Prosecutor of Russia has offered to provide the Trump campaign with official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary Clinton. Information that would be very useful to your father, which he adds, is part of Russia and its government's support for Mr. Trump. Within days, Rob Goldstone was inside the room where it happened, at Trump Tower as the Russians, including Kremlin-linked lawyer Natalia Veselnitskaya, sat across the table from Paul Manafort, Jared Kushner and Don Trump Jr. That moment has become a touchstone for the Mueller investigation into collusion with Russia. Um, the lawyer, Veselnitskaya, later explained to NBC her connections to Russia's chief prosecutor. And the White House was caught out in a half-truth when, at first, the president dictated a short statement on his son's behalf, saying the meeting was mainly about the adoption program of Russian children suspended by the Kremlin in retaliation for sanctions. 
Only later was it revealed Don Trump Jr. had taken the meeting on the promise of damaging information about Hillary Clinton. Now it's Rob Goldstone's turn to explain his role in what happened. Have you ever been part of a Russian plot to influence the American election? I haven't. It actually sounds quite... What, Jack Ryder, is that his name? Jack somebody or other, Jack Sparrow? No, I haven't. Let's start with that email. Um, now, in it you wrote, the Crown Prosecutor of Russia was offering to provide the Trump campaign with official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary and her dealings with Russia. It's obviously very high level and sensitive information, but it's part of Russia and its government's support for Mr. Trump. Why did you write all that? I wrote it because, like I'd done so many times before, I simply sent an email on behalf of a client. So when my client, Emin, called me and asked me to set this up, I was shocked. First of all, because even in private, we'd never discussed politics. So I asked a couple of questions, uh, which I thought any normal person would. I said, well, who is this attorney? And Emin said, a well-connected attorney. And I said, connected, well-connected, what does that mean? He repeated again, well-connected, and I flippantly said, connected to what? A power socket? The power grid? Nothing. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to find out any more there. And then I said, and what about this information? What is it specifically? And he said to me, you know, that doesn't matter. All I'm asking you to do is get the meeting. Who else is there? There's a translator that the attorney brought with her. And who speaks at the meeting? She does. What does she say? She opens by saying how there were people who were donating. And it was a very generic thing about, like, how dare they fund a campaign when these, this is money that they should be paying taxes on. And she switched and she said, but what I really want to talk about is the Magnitsky Act and especially the effect it's having on the adoption of Russian children. So these are the sanctions that were put in place against Russia right. in relation to the death of Sergei Magnitsky. Exactly. But I'd never heard of Magnitsky or his act, so it meant nothing. And what stuck in my So it head, felt... Is that the bait and switch that's that the you bait and switch. talk about? So you say she goes in pretending to have something. She gives generic nonsense. She does rather have than something, but it's dirt. generic. Yeah. And the switch is now let's address the issues of sanctions and adoptions and Magnitsky. What I didn't know then, but what I've come to learn is, that's not a throwaway switch. That's really an important issue for Vladimir Putin. So much so that when I watched a press conference from Helsinki with him and Donald Trump, I was shocked when I heard him mention the name Bill Browder and Magnitsky. I'm like, wait, 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 this is the same names that she talked about. So when people go, ah, you're naive. Why would she do a bait and switch for something that's not important? It is important. There was fallout for the president and for Don Trump Jr. because their story shifted in terms of what they said the meeting was about initially. Initially they said it was about adoptions and then it came out, thanks to Don Trump Jr. in your email, that initially they were expecting dirt on Hillary Clinton. But there was fallout too for you personally. Christopher Hill, a former ambassador um, from the US, called you a useful... Id uh, sorry. Yes, a useful idiot for the Russians. Yeah, it's somebody who in Soviet times, you know... Could said be that played, could, could be, be played. used. And it got me thinking, it did get me thinking, because as I say, I may not be political, but I'm not completely stupid, that there is, I suppose, I keep an open mind. I won't close the door to the fact that I don't know all the facts. You know, Robert Mueller has an investigation going on, and if at the end of that, part of it was that maybe I'd been used, well, I would be horrified. With hindsight and with all the knowledge, especially the knowledge when Natalia Veselnitskaya said on NBC, I am an informant, whatever she meant, that means something. That led me to believe, you know what, with that knowledge, I would have typed on my phone those 137 words, thought about it, and gone, just forget it and hit delete. But perhaps the irony is that you wrote an email that in fact reflected reality very closely. I mean, maybe Muller may well conclude that this was part of an official effort by the Russian government to intervene using the prospect of dirt on Hillary Clinton. They had all those emails to come to try to gain influence within the Trump campaign. Collusion. Even though I know it was puffed up, I did it really well. 
because you could argue that almost a hundred percent of that has been proven, not by me, and not by you, to be correct. So, so your defense in a way is that by mistake you got it right? Yes. Yes. And it's hard for people to grasp, and I get that. Well, Kylie, all of this is rather distracting attention from another major headache for Donald Trump, which is the row about his nomination to the Supreme Court, Brett Kavanaugh. Tell us, what's the latest on that? Yes, Kelly, it's hard to know which story is meant to distract from which, really. One might lead to a constitutional crisis in terms of Rod Rosenstein, and the other might torpedo the, the appointment of a Supreme Court justice. So the latest on that remains a hearing on Thursday when Dr Christine Blasey Ford, who accuses Judge Kavanaugh of sexually assaulting her at a party when she was 15 and he was 17, an allegation he denies. On Thursday, she's due to travel from California to here in Washington to give evidence before the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is considering her testimony against that of Judge Kavanaugh. Now, I can't tell you how fiercely this is being discussed. You can't walk a block in this town without overhearing people debating the appearance of Dr. Ford and the bona fides of Judge Kavanaugh, many of them drawing parallels with the confirmation hearings of Justice Clarence Thomas and the public shaming by the committee of his accuser, Anita Hill, a colleague who accused him of sexual harassment. Now, that is being elevated, of course, too, by new reporting from The New Yorker of another woman who alleges that Judge Kavanaugh at another party exposed himself to her when they were both students at Yale, which the judge also denies. So there's a lot of excavation of memory going on and a concerted PR effort, I've got to say, by both the Democrats and the Republicans to champion either Dr. Ford or Judge Kavanaugh. Now, Judge Kavanaugh has just written to the committee saying he won't be intimidated into withdrawing his nomination, that these are smears, he says, pure and simple. Kylie, thank you very much. Now, in the US, the Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, has said that he will not be stepping aside after a second woman accused him of sexual misconduct decades ago. The allegations have threatened Mr Kavanaugh's chances of winning confirmation for the post uh, in the Senate. Earlier today, President Trump pledged his support for Judge Kavanaugh, described him as an outstanding person. Our North America editor, John Sopel, has this report. Donald Trump arrived at the United Nations with the usual ring of steel around him. But the person in need of greatest protection is the president's pick for the Supreme Court, Brett Kavanaugh. A confirmation that two weeks ago was looking routine now looks imperiled. This is a fine man and we certainly hope he's going to be confirmed and quickly. His family has suffered. His family has suffered. What's going on is not something that should happen. Brett Kavanaugh is an absolute outstanding person. Hopefully, he will be confirmed quickly. Thank you very much. A second woman came forward last night to accuse Judge Kavanaugh of sexual misconduct. Deborah Ramirez claims the judge exposed himself when they were students together at Yale University. Meanwhile, the lawyer representing the former porn star Stormy Daniels, who claims she had an affair with Donald Trump, says he is acting for a third woman. But Brett Kavanaugh is fighting back. In a fresh letter to the committee, he said he won't be intimidated into withdrawing his nomination. These are smears pure and simple, and they debase our public discourse, he writes. But they're also a threat to any man or woman who wishes to serve our country. Such grotesque and obvious character assassination, if allowed to succeed, will dissuade competent and good people of all political persuasions from service. That's why we need Brett Kavanaugh on the U.S. Supreme Court. TV is awash, meanwhile, with ads either extolling the virtues of the man... Give it to his family. He's of the highest integrity as a person. ...or the alleged vices. Don't put another sexual predator on the Supreme Court. This isn't the only fire that Donald Trump has been fighting. The rumour mill's been alive that the Deputy Attorney General might be about to resign or be fired. He's overseeing the investigation into whether there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians prior to the election. Something that Donald Trump has repeatedly said is a hoax and a witch hunt. But if he were to go, would the Russia inquiry go with him? Something that could plunge the US into fresh constitutional controversy. Rosenstein left his home this morning knowing that many around the president were demanding his scalp. The New York Times alleged last Friday that it asked colleagues to wear a wire to record the president with the aim of proving that Mr Trump was mentally unfit to be in office. Rosenstein said this was a joke. The White House wasn't laughing.
Thank you all for being here this morning. It is the a president who's honor. meeting world leaders ahead of his address to the UN tomorrow will see Rosenstein on Thursday when he's back in Washington. This has already been an exceptionally turbulent week and it's still Monday. John Sopel, BBC News, New York.